you see why the gospel of today's Mass, short as it is, was chosen for this wonderful feast of Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. Hail, full of grace. Now, full of grace was a phrase, in the English anyway, that was used twice in sacred scripture. Once for St. Stephen, the first martyr, and the other was for Our Lady. In English, it doesn't come across the same way as it ought to come across. Just one single translation, full of grace. But in the original text, the full of grace referring to St. Stephen just meant that he was holy. Whereas the original text in the original language of the full of grace referred to Mary meant that she was absolutely immaculate free of all sin and free from every imperfection. You can always tell them, the the Protestants and those who do not believe in Our Lady's immaculate conception, those words, to go back to the original language of sacred scripture and not to some translation that was made perhaps from another translation before that and so on and so forth. Refer them to the original. And there they will understand what full of grace meant for Our Lady. Well, this feast of the Immaculate Conception, it's interesting, isn't it, how this glorious feast, and here we're dressed in gold and have all the candles lighted in the sanctuary. And it's a very great feast to celebrate. But it comes in the midst of the penitential season of Advent. But don't let that confuse you. This feast is in perfect harmony with the spirit of Advent. What is more fitting, after all, while we're preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ, the Redeemer, than to think of her who is that Redeemer's very own mother, Now, during Advent, we relive the 4,000 years before Christ. That is what these four candles symbolize in the wreath, each of them a thousand years preceding Christ's birth. It was a time in which the world longed for its Savior. And it was a time in which the prophets and the saints of the Old Testament, all of them prayed with great fervor and a fervent hope for the coming of the Messiah. But the very promise of this Messiah was included in the promise of Our Lady, a peerless virgin. You see, after the fall of Adam and Eve, when God had just cursed the wicked serpent for deceiving Eve and Adam, God said to that serpent, I will put enmities between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed and she shall crush thy head. And we see the virgin whose coming was foretold. We see her approaching white as snow, more beautiful than the sun, full of grace and blessed among all women. Now, it was in view of the fact that she would become the mother of the incarnate Word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, that Mary alone was preserved from original sin. And that is only the negative aspect of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, that she was free from original sin and even the slightest shadow of imperfection. She was free from all of that. But the positive part of the Immaculate Conception was that she was also from the very first moment of her existence in the womb of her mother, gratia plena, full of grace. And theologians teach this about Mary too, that she began her spiritual life 
with grace much more abundant and perfect than that which the greatest saints have acquired at the end of their lives. And that is worth meditation. You imagine someone like the curé of ours who dedicated his entire life to saving souls. So much so that Satan himself revealed if there were just three more priests as holy as this man, then my empire would be destroyed with just three more priests as holy as him who spent 16 hours a day hearing confessions and then going to speak to his people and always then returning to the altar of God to offer Mass and to kneel before the Blessed Sacrament. What penances he did. Or we think of the North American martyrs who were ready for the glory of God and the salvation of souls to lose their life, to shed their blood for Christ's name. How they suffered in their martyrdom. It was most brutal and excruciating. Yet they did it all with great love and willfully, not holding anything back. And yet all the merit that these saints had at the end of their life after doing such glorious deeds. Our Lady already had more than that at the first instant of her conception. And we mustn't think that Our Lady merely kept this degree of of grace in her soul. Rather, that that was only her starting point. And from there she grew daily in grace and in virtue because she cooperated fully and most perfectly to every moment of grace that was offered her and to every request of God. A perfect example from her life would be her fiat to the Archangel Gabriel. Our Lady knew perfectly well what it would be to be the mother of God. It was not some title that would win her honors in this world. No, it was a title that would win her much suffering. Suffering greater than any other man or woman or child had ever experienced or will ever experience. And her faith was so great that she understood that. And yet she was so in tune with God's holy will and his plan of the redemption, that she said immediately, Fiat, let it be done to me according to thy word. As if to say, this is your will. No matter what happens to me, I prefer your will. That is how perfectly in tune she was with the will of God. Or how she responded to those moments of grace There is an example of this in the same scene. Our Lady had just made her fiat and the archangel goes into the the topic of her cousin Elizabeth, how she is expecting a child. And the angel mentions simply that she is with child. That was her moment of grace. She didn't need to be told by the angel what she ought to do. She saw someone in need. She saw an opportunity to merit and to grow in grace and in charity. And she set out on that long journey to where her cousin lived. And there she performed the commonplace deeds of any housewife. She swept the floors of her cousin. She took care of the cooking, perhaps the sewing, whatever else needed to be done, she did because she was so receptive of the graces of God. And then on top of it, she merited by bearing her every cross with the most perfect resignation to the divine will. Remember this, when she accepted to be the mother of God, every day was agony for her because she saw her little infant 
whom she held in her arms. She would look down at his face, and all she could think was that this child is destined to die on a cross. And when he grew up and worked in wood, in, in the carpentry shop, and she would hear the pounding of the hammer on the nails, what do you think she thought of? But her son's hands and feet being nailed to a gibbet. And then as she stood at the foot of the cross, when it finally did come in to, when it finally happened, what did she do? She wept a little, yes, but they were tears of resignation. They were tears of full resignation. And she would hear the very priests that were to usher her son into this world mock the Messiahs. And do you think that she would speak up and rebuke them for that? No, her faith was so great that she would endure even her son and her God being mocked for the sake of saving other souls. I don't know a mother on this planet that would not defend their child if that child were being mocked and persecuted. But Mary's faith and her resignation was so strong that she would not do it because it was God's holy will. Not a complaint, nothing, except perfect union with the divine will. And her charity and her grace, therefore, increased in her in rapid measures. And only in heaven will we get to see the beauty of the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and how beautiful it must be if you would die of joy at seeing a saint, a saint's soul filled with sanctifying grace, that was after working to gain that for so many years, what must it be to see Our Lady after her life had been ended? It must be a beautiful thing. But this feast leads us not only to contemplate the beauties of Our Lady's Immaculate Conception, but with all the doctrines of the church, it leads to practice for our spiritual life. And it is this, that we are meant, although we were not born in the state of original justice, we are meant every day to live for Christ. We are meant every day to merit as much as possible for heaven, to look for those moments of grace, and they're offered at every moment of the day. There are the graces, those moments when it's time, when you recognize it's time to keep quiet, lest I offend my God. There are the graces that come to you, well, I need to do this or that house chore around here. There are the graces inviting you to prayer. There are the graces that come into your life, such as the cross. When the cross comes, you have to pick it up and shoulder it and carry it down Mount Calvary with our Lord without a complaint, even should you be crucified on that very cross. That is what we are meant to do, for nothing else matters in this life but that we get to heaven. And we should never be satisfied with just some lowly place in heaven God gives to each one of us a certain amount of grace because He wants us all to have a certain amount of glory in heaven. Each one of us different. And it's up to us to correspond with those moments of grace. And to this end, ask Our Lady, who is always most willing to cooperate with these graces, ask Him, Her, to point out these moments to you, to give you the grace and the strength to cooperate with all of God's graces so that at the end of your life, you can appear before the Blessed Virgin and thank her for all the helps that she gave towards your salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.